Once again, this week we're returning to focus more specifically upon the content that is in the textbooks. What you have here today is about 25 minutes of a recorded class that Dr. Clavel Hall gave focusing upon chapters 4 through 6 of the White et al. textbook. You'll notice that I've cut out uh, the sections where they've been engaged in class discussion as you're going through the lecture because while well, Dr. Clavel Hall was gracious enough to allow us permission to use these recordings. I've not contacted each of the students individually to see if I could use their contributions, so I've been cutting those out as we go through. You'll note that throughout the lecture it focuses more so on chapter 4 with uh, some reference to the CUSP model in chapter 5 and then some discussion near the end of the leadership aspects that you see in chapter 6. And I would suggest that the amount of coverage that Dr. Clavel Hall spends on each of these three chapters is probably indicative of the way in which you should approach them. Uh, chapters 4 and 5 seem to be more illustrative of some of the ideas and concepts that are being raised in chapter 4. So as I look through and review the content that Dr. Clavel Hall has prepared here, that's how I would go about looking at this. The other thing you will note at the beginning, and then there's a little bit in the middle where um, what has happened is the students who are in the Zoom classroom have not muted their microphones, so you're getting some feedback from their, essentially, Dr. Clavel Hall's voice coming through their speakers, being picked up by their mic. So um, she notices that a couple of times throughout the lecture, and um, while I've cut the part where she does this out of the recording that I've prepared for you. At a couple of points, she does ask the students in the class to mute their microphones, and as soon as she does that, you'll note that the quality of the recording improves significantly. So that's why they're sort of almost like there's two different levels of quality as you listen to this recording, one where the students have forgotten to mute their microphones and then ones where they have. So I apologize about that uh, occurring and uh, as you can see Dr. Clavel Hall was quite skilled in noticing uh, when it was happening and uh, addressing it with the students. So we'll pick this up again at the end and uh, have a little bit of a concluding thought with respect to these three chapters. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Clavel Hall and the recording. So today we're going to talk a bit about application of translation, and that's the translation of evidence-based practice. And we go into as we go into this, can I get, we have a few objectives here, and as we look at application, we're looking at. Uh, application for evidence-based practice and we're trying to focus on outcomes because with uh, EBP we're looking a lot at outcomes and where safety and quality is concerned that's one of our major um, points to look at and looking at applying different tools to do that and here are some of the we've read about some of the tools that we're going to look at and a little bit of how leaders will also use some of the tools. So when we talk about patient outcomes, we're talking about the end result of care and how it can be attributed to the services that were provided. So we're connect we're talking about the connection between the services and the end results of that service for patients. And when we look at uh, how we quantify them, I'm sure that uh, as we go forward tonight, a few of you will be able to point out areas where you dealt with nursing indicators and metrics. So quantifying the outcomes looks at the indicators and metrics to gauge the type of care that was given. And even as you use these uh, metrics and indicators, they usually have to be valid and reliable indicators. So then when we talk about uh, outcomes, we need to know that outcomes depend on quality and safety. And we had this quote about quality, about it being the degree of health services 
for individuals and populations, and they increase the likelihood of attaining the desired health outcome. And uh, they're consistent with current professional knowledge. I thought it was very interesting that this quote is not a recent quote, but its essence hasn't changed in all of these years that the degree of service is going to correlate usually with the likelihood of positive outcome. And then we look at safety. Safety is a component of quality. And we have, they work hand in hand. And do you remember in any of your readings where these seven characteristics, uh, I'd say what, these six characteristics were pointed out in your reading by which entity? So the first one I remember reading about in our readings was from IOM in one of their, uh, in one of their reports, one of their safety reports, uh, as that they put it out, but it's placed in other writings as well. And I think I had it in, uh, in IOM, I believe it's about 2001, that they put it out, IOM, Institute of Medicine, saying that our healthcare system is broken and it needs to be redesigned. And as we redesign the broken, fragmented United States healthcare system, we need to do it with the focus of these areas in mind, that it has to be safe, timely, efficient, effective, equitable, and patient-centered. I cheat with my old memory and call it the steep characteristics so that I can remember them. And then as we do that, we're looking toward something we'll talk about shortly, looking at the cost efficiency and quality of doing it. But when we think about high quality healthcare, this is something that uh, we need to think about. And it brings us back to something we talked about before which was the cost effectiveness uh, analysis and looking at how do you deliver healthcare with these characteristics in a cost effective manner. And that's when the uh, practitioners exercise some of those economic evaluation formulas to be able to ensure that yes, we can give higher quality care with these characteristics. However, what's it going to cost? And the question I put out to you as a class is, have you ever heard about a potential change that your organization was thinking about but decided not to because of cost? You see, it's different, it can be different lines of thinking and I'm not trying to insinuate that the CEO never cares about the patients because they are the consumers. However, they still have to think about the bottom line. And the bottom line is I have 160 bids to, to uh, keep filled. So you have to balance that. How do I take care of the ones I'm already contracted to take care of and still not uh, put, it, uh, put us too much in the red by not by not keeping as many of the beds filled safely uh, with the sick people that we do have. It's going to cost money. Uh, I love that Suzanne was just not willing to take off her humanitarian hat there, that we still have to think about uh, ways of improving uh, health care. But I have to tell you, nurses don't think enough about where's the money, follow the money. Uh, and that an, can be an uncomfortable feeling, or if not uncomfortable, not natural, because nurses are not accustomed to having to think about how much money are we losing by quarantining these X number of patients. Jenny picks up and says, look, I have to keep patients care, patient-centered care, one of our characteristics, front and center, even though it may cost us some money. So what we're here doing now as evolving DMPs and leaders in nursing is we have to keep the mind 
of Suzanne and the humanitarian portion. And Jenny, yes, we have to take care of these people, but at the same time, we can't forget about what's going on with the money also. So maybe there's a, what's the best way to do both? Because as you're taking care of those people, there's Mr. Johnson mm -hmm. counting the budget and what's allotted for this unit for this year. And yes, there, Jenny's accruing extra costs for good reason. And now me as the CFO, I've got to figure out how we're going to balance all of this, given we've had this, un, uh, what is it, this, this outbreak that we didn't plan on. So I'm just trying to stretch our thinking into places that nurses don't usually have to delve. Make sense? So as we move on, we talk about outcomes and we talk about different ways to measure outcomes. And part of what goes on is we're looking at, this is a, what, nursing intervention classification and nursing outcome classifications. Have, has anyone ever heard of these? two types of classifications. They are ways in which to evaluate nursing care, the care given. You'll find a discussion of them in the white book on page 76. There are ways to evaluate outcomes. And we, this is just one way. This way is evaluating nursing care outcome. And then we look at the high cap survey. The uh, the first set we looked at the NICs and the NOC. The NIC and NOC that was looking at measuring nursing uh, nursing care. And as you've pointed out, Lindsay, high I want to call it high cap age cap uh, hospital consumer assessment for healthcare providers and systems. This is the consumers. Uh, perspective. And uh, as Lindsay explained, this is where you're being judged by your consumers and the care that you've get, you give. And uh, it is sometimes linked to payer information. Okay. Uh, and looking at how much, what, say, insurance companies will pay, Medicaid, Medicare government entities may pay. So patient satisfaction scores have become really prominent in recent years. Uh, any of, I believe a few of you may have been in nursing for over 15 years during a time, over 15 years ago, when patient satisfaction scores were not uh, given as much weight as they are today. And not only is it given weight today, it is linked to compensation, as she points out. So this is another way that care is, uh, is uh, outcomes are measured and uh, from healthcare and nursing care. So this is from the consumer perspective. The first was from the nursing perspective. And who has heard of NDNQI? Anybody worked with that type of uh, survey before? Okay. And so these are looking at nursing sensitive indicators, as Amandeep says. And they not only look, look at the nursing sensitive indicators, but they're looking at them in relation to the patient outcomes. So they're measuring things like uh, the nursing quality uh, that's being delivered, as well as things like improving the nursing uh, satisfaction. Why do you think it's important to care about nursing satisfaction when you're thinking about patient outcomes based on your readings and your own experiences? To the point of good patient outcomes where you've seen decreases in falls, you've seen decreased length of stays in some of the care units or ICU type units, uh, patients uh, being having to receive less pain medicine. Studies have shown that more contact with the nurses by the patients is, uh, it does correlate with improved care. Gallup poll 
just announced, I think, about the 16th or 17th time that the nursing profession is um, among the most highly trusted professions of all professions. And uh, that is something that helps a lot when we have good nursing care. And I would have to say one of the ways for us to get good nursing care is to have patient to nurse ratios that are going to allow good nurses to develop good care, okay? You can have a good nurse, but if they're taking care of 18 patients in an eight hour shift and can barely say hello to the patient, she, the patients are not getting the quality of care that that nurse would like to deliver or she can't or he can't get to the charting or making medication errors because of the workload. All of that goes to improved nursing satisfaction, which goes to looking at improve the, improving the care of the patients. So uh, making happy nurses is good for making healthier patients. So we're gonna go on to our next topic now uh, in our lecture series here. And that's going to be looking at the clinical practice guidelines something that uh, you were told to uh, be prepared to discuss tonight. So clinical practice guidelines being the systematic development of statements to assist both the practitioner and the patient in decision making about appropriate care for specific clinical circumstances. So we're looking at them here and you're going to discuss them a little more uh, in detail. And I know most of you, we've talked about this uh, diagram a few times now. So which phase of the translational continuum is clinical practice guidelines a part of? Part of T3. And okay, so you're going to start seeing this in the practice areas. It's going to help us. It's going to start guiding some of your practices. And it's supposed to be helping to standardize things. But like much things in healthcare and nursing, it comes with barriers. And when you think about clinical practice guidelines, as uh, Kyle has stated, that uh, there's something so that we can follow it. And uh, so now we're looking at some of the uh, barriers to clinical practice guidelines. Some of them were some of these clinical practice guidelines were conflicting with each other because different groups put together the different clinical practice guidelines. There's also something said that all clinical practice guidelines are not solidly evidence-based, which is problematic for uh, certain people for it to be asked to follow guidelines that are not evidence-based in this time of uh, EVP practice. And then people have talked about some clinical practice guidelines or like cookbook medicine or cookbook nursing, where you're just following the steps and no critical thinking, like evidence-based practice. Critical thinking is a very important part of what we're doing in nursing now. The reason you're in your DMP program, that you're not just looking to follow recipes, but these are critics of the clinical practice guidelines. Not everyone thinks of them in that way. And some have talked about in your book that it's a threat uh, to practitioner autonomy. In my experience, it's usually criticized as a threat more by physicians than other practitioners uh, in saying that basically you can't tell me how to practice. I've gone to school for X number of years. How dare you? I am the final determinant of uh, how I care for my patient. And that's true. The physician is the final determinant of care. The uh, flip side of this uh, threat to autonomy is that clinical practice guidelines are only meant to be facilitator of care to help you start thinking about issues that one may not have thought about in looking at a certain set of uh, symptoms in getting to care. And uh, actually, I want to say that in artificial intelligence that we use in healthcare, sometimes looking at symptoms, there are renowned hospitals that use 
databases and artificial intelligence that help physicians to make diagnoses because they have been able to collect more data than any one individual can collect by reading articles. And then the final one, patients lacking understanding of evidence-based practice and clinical uh, practice guidelines, because a lot of people feel that, uh, patients may feel that you only wanna treat me in this way with these guidelines because it's cheaper for the organization, which is sometimes a, a skeptical attitude uh, from the patients about it. So clinical practice guidelines are, have their, their uh, critics and they also have those that support it, but you need to be aware of it because we use it in our practice. So then when we look at types of clinical practice guidelines, what was the agree tool about? Okay, so thank you for that. So this is the tool that you would use to determine if those CPGs are appropriate for your clinical area. So it's the thing that you use before you start implementing the CPGs, okay? So this is a tool to evaluate it. And so as we have uh, CPGs, because as uh, one of you said there to try and get practitioners on the same page with uh, practice in a specific area, they're not all equal in their rigor. And that's why you need to evaluate them before using them. So we're gonna move a little quickly here because I want to uh, give you a chance to talk about your clinical practice guidelines. I'm just gonna start introducing some of you probably have already heard of this before and certainly should have read about it having completed your readings. The triple aim coming from uh, the IHI, looking at ways for us to improve our quality and safety in our healthcare environment to be able to uh, provide better health for the population as a whole better patient satisfaction individually and looking at improving the cost, which is usually bringing the, down the cost with while maintaining the quality. <clears throat> so that is a premise of much of our work as we go forward. But then recently, the uh, triple aim actually had another component added to it. So now that triple aim is now the quadruple aim. And the portion that was added to the triple aim is satisfied providers. And we've talked about from a nursing standpoint, uh, how important it is to have satisfied nurses, which impacts all of the other areas of the quadruple aim. So we have that, we'll be talking about that in reference to our patient quality and safety is where this was derived from. And then we have the situation with high reliability organizations. And so looking at people doing dangerous work, but keeping the, uh, the harm to individuals at a minimum and or as close to zero as possible. And healthcare is looked at as a high reliability organization. Would you say that health care organizations do dangerous work? You know, and even though we haven't changed what we've been doing, we're changing the way we look at what we've been doing. And yes, I, I, I worked for 24 years as, no, maybe 25 years as a nurse anesthetist. Every day I could have killed an individual every day that I did my job, but it was a required job. Chemotherapy nurses, dialysis nurses, ICU nurses, and even uh, perioperative nurses, we can all consider ourselves in a high reliability organization where we're doing something that could be dangerous if we don't uh, minimize the errors that we could harm someone. So that's where we are with that. And we're trying to think more like these organizations who've been doing a better job at having fewer uh, harm, harms to their consumers and to their employees is where we're trying to go. So we look at 
this particular framework. We've talked about frameworks and models. This is one more framework we're going to just look at briefly. Uh, it's called the CUSP model, the Comprehensive Unit-Based Safety uh, Program, where they are trying to use these steps that are listed here so that they can try and empower frontline staff people to be able to focus and identify problems, bring them to the attention of the needed people so that they can minimize harm and empower the people who are at the front line of the workforce so that they can help make organizational changes. And that's some of the things that magnet institutions are trying to promote and other institutions are trying to promote. So this is another model that you may consider. And as I said, when we're talking about these models, you wanna think about your papers, your, your EBP projects, because you will be having to choose a model for your uh, evidence-based practice DMP project. So these are steps for that. The last thing I want to say uh, here is leadership. You've talked a lot about leadership this evening and looking at leadership and translating it into practice. These are some characteristics of leaders that specifically trying to work harder at connecting people to purpose, doing the advocacy work. And as you've talked about tonight, it's not a simple position to be in. Uh, I, I like, uh, I think it was Jenny's word, the sandwich position. Uh, not always a comfortable place. Sometimes you'll find your loyalties not uh, easily dis distinguished between uh, the choices that you have to make. So looking at leadership, your book has talked a bit about transformational leadership. This is one of the types of leadership that we're looking at trying to uh, implement in nursing more because it's a, a supply support throughout the organization, and you're trying to help people to become leaders, trying to help people to become critical thinkers, trying to help people to become problem solvers through inspiration, uh, through education, and um, challenging them to stretch their abilities. And it's not through blaming, it's not through punishing, it's not through firing, and these are some of the results that they've seen in transformational leadership, the difference in the pers patient's perspective, as well as the nurses, how they see their positions differently when transformational leadership is used. These are things that uh, we could talk about in much more depth. We will see them a bit later, but I just want to bring that to your attention for today. And with that, I'm going to stop here with our, uh, with our presentation. And as we've talked about the magnet institutions a little bit as well. It's actually interesting because while Dr. Clavel Hall only referenced the previous slides sort of in passing, in all honesty, the only other slide that was left in her slide deck was this summary slide. And as you can see here, she's essentially trying to summarize the three chapters as best she can. And in all honesty, three points. And I think if you look at it, these are really the three main ideas from each of the chapters. So if you're looking at it, um, chapter four, and I guess really the entire white at all textbook to be perfectly honest with you uh, is trying to get across the notion that the more that we translate research into practice and the more that we engage in evidence-based practice the better our clinical outcomes will become or the more that action will facilitate improved clinical outcomes it's introduced in chapter four and then continues into chapter five this idea that clinical based um, or clinical practice guidelines that are based upon evidence 
can provide a useful model or a useful framework that allows for decision making by both practitioners and patients. One of the nice things about using a model or a framework that comes from an evidence-based clinical practice guideline is it's something that can be presented to our patients, something that can be explained by our healthcare practitioners to that patient so that not only is the patient simply making a decision based upon the advice and the word of their healthcare providers, but based upon at least some understanding of the overall concept that is being suggested for them. Uh, finally, and this mainly comes, I think, is the main takeaway from chapter six, is that when we look at the leadership of health corps organizations, one of the things that we need or that needs to be underscored is both the importance of and the fact that it is actually occurring where health corps organizations are being seen more and more as high reliability organizations. And I think one of the things that, and White and uh, her colleagues don't really get into this in a great detail in the textbook, but I think one of the things that is happening within society that is helping facilitate this transition or this evolution is the simple fact that healthcare has become a much more political issue. And because of that, people are becoming much more informed about healthcare as an organization, healthcare as an industry, if you will. And that additional knowledge, that additional discussion, the fact that it's something that people are talking about as a part of their regular conversation and not just with their healthcare providers when they get sick or with their friends and families when they need to engage in the healthcare system, the fact that it has become part of the everyday discourse. That is, in my opinion, and um, it's somewhat alluded to, although only an illusion um, in the textbook, that um, this is contributing to this evolution of healthcare organizations being seen as high reliability organizations and a greater desire among the populace or among the public for healthcare to be seen in the same light as some of these other high, rel high reliability organizations that Dr. Clavel Hall mentioned. So that was really the focus of the lecture. Following Dr. Clavel Hall's lecture, the students within Zoom for the remaining 45 minutes to an hour of the recording actually engaged in the exact same activity that we are engaging in this week in the discussion area. So that initial post that you make or that initial response you make that unlocked the content to allow you to view this particular lecture as well as the engagement that you're having afterwards is essentially what Dr. Clavel Hall facilitated as a part of the synchronous Zoom session uh, following basically where you saw the recording conclude. So that's it for this particular lecture. If you have any questions, as always, feel free to reach out and contact me.